Experiences don't take place in a vacuum. They are part of some kind of system with many moving parts that must be accounted for if we're going to design a positive experience. So when we use systems thinking, we can become better aware of what those parts are and how to address them. Also, we can learn how some of those parts create for negative, positive, ideal, whatever experiences we're trying to do. So Peter Checkland and soft systems methodology is one really useful way of mapping out these systems and determining those parts. So I'm going to walk briefly through soft systems methodology in a way that will help you to operate the method at the most basic level. We're not going to dig into the deep stuff here today, but it will get you started. The hope here of systems thinking is that it will highlight components of systems that you might not account for, that will enrich your design process, uh, your research effort, whatever it is. So you'll know what to look for, what needs to be addressed, and how to go about those next steps. So there's an acronym that's key for soft systems methodology, um, and it's called CAT Woe. Um, there's also a version called BAT Wove. You're like, Dennis, what the heck are you saying? I'll shed some light on those for the rest of the video. We're going to use BAT Wove as an acronym that is really useful for this tool. So here's BAT Wove, and I've you know written this up very loosely on my iPad. Um, we've got BAT Wove there. So let's talk about the parts. First, um, BAT Wove is not the proper order that you should operate this method. So I know that's a bit confusing, but it's that's the easiest way to remember it is BAT Wove. So the first part is the T, which is called transformation. So over here on the right, the transformation, I'm sorry, the left, the transformation is the thing you're trying to achieve, the thing a system does. So oftentimes the, the transformation can seem really kind of strangely simple. So a transformation for bus transportation, let's say around a town, we're in Oxford, Ohio. Um, the transformation is you start with the in of I am um, at a location where I don't want to be. The transformation is I get on the bus and I travel. And then the outcome is I get to a location where I want to be. So let's say I start at home. That is my in, I get on the bus, and the transformation is I arrive at my office on the campus at Miami University. So the transformation is pretty simple. And for your design process, define what that transformation is. What are you trying to change? If it's an existing design, what is the change being made? This is what I love about pinpointing transformation, which sounds really small. If you can't clearly say what the transformation is, then you've got a problem. You need to have a very simple thing you're trying to accomplish. Transformation could be, we are trying to sell more corn chips in Wisconsin. It could be, we're trying to improve the number of voters for a school levy in our town in Wyoming. It could be, we're trying to transport people from uh, an airport in Turkey to an airport in Africa, in a city there. So whatever that transfer transformation is, it should be very clear and very simple to make this go. So that's our transformation. Next, we look at the environment. So the environment are factors that are oftentimes beyond our control. So environmental concerns and factors could be um, weather, or they could be concerns about uh, an economic downturn in a, uh, in a certain context. These are oftentimes concerns that we can't account for or change. Sorry, they're, they're concerns we can't change. Sometimes we can't account for them. Sometimes we can through design. So if uh, we are doing a school levy project, let's say we're raising funds, and trying to get a, a, a tax passed so people can fund the school for, uh, fund our schools for arts education. In the environment, in that space around, if the environment is such that there is an economic downturn, uh, maybe inflation is high, 
then that could significantly impact um, our ability to pass such a law where we're asking people to give more and pay more in taxes. So environment are all those external factors. Again, there's a lot of times stuff we just can't account for or we can't change. We can account for, but we can't change. Sometimes we can. But don't forget the importance of all of those concerns. Sometimes they're real and sometimes they are um, intangible, like economic downturn, threat of war, um, pandemic. We've seen even some of these very recently. Okay, so that's the E. Now we move along to the worldview or the Weltanschung. And here in the worldview, um, let me talk about that because you'll see that bracket impacts um, all these other letters to the right of it. So the worldview is the overall uh, um, attitude at that time in, uh, in that context. I know that was really fuzzy. Let me pinpoint that. So if the worldview, uh, the Weltanschung, um, Let's talk about taxes and raising taxes for funding schools for arts training. If the overall worldview there is that the arts enrich our students' lives, no matter what they study, those interested in business, engineering, as well as the arts, benefit from the arts because it makes them more creative individuals for their future endeavors. So if that's the worldview, the arts are hugely impactful no matter who you are, then that's a favorable worldview for us trying to raise funds or pass a tax. If the worldview in, let's use a more uh, 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 concrete and maybe commercial example, if the worldview is that um, uh, snack foods are unhealthy um, or snack foods are only for special times, you know, like then uh, we might need to have a different kind of ad campaign that tells that story and aligns with the worldview at that time to get people to buy corn chips or whatever. Um, so they know corn chips are awesome. We love corn chips. They're for special snack times that aligns with the worldview at that time. If we tried to ever say they're actually um, that corn chips are a health food, that would be inconsistent with the worldview at the time and could create some <laughs> That'd be really an uphill climb of trying to convince people of uh, to buy our corn chips. So that's the worldview. I'd say worldview, Weltanschauung is the most fuzzy part of this model. Try to pinpoint and write a statement that captures what is the feeling, the the way the people uh, and and the uh, the all the actors, what is their view? of whatever you're trying to design and their attitude at that time. That's what the worldview is trying to help you to determine. So then we get into um, O, and the O of um, soft systems methodology is our owners. These are the owners or the people who are running or operating, um, I'm sorry, these are the people who own or create whatever the system is. So if we are a store, let's say we're a store that sells plants, the owner is the person who owns the store. They are very invested in that store's success because they want to sell plants and they want to um, make money off of that sale of goods. If their worldview is that plants enrich the world and everyone's lives, perhaps that owner would be more willing to lower their prices because they are driven by plants enriching the world. If the worldview is we want to make lots of money off our plants and uh, buy another Lexus or whatever, uh, that worldview will probably shape how that owner runs their business. So who are the owners? Define who they are. Oftentimes that's driven by the worldview. Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. If you're analyzing an existing design, try and figure out if there's inconsistencies there between the worldview and who the owners are. So define who they are. Who are our owners? So notice the A, B, and V now. Now we move into three of them that are inside the environment and also impacted by the owners. These three first are actors for A. Actors are the people who run the business or run the effort. If we're trying to pass a levy, uh, tax, uh, uh, raising funds to fuel the arts, then the actors um, are the people who um, 
might be lobbyists. They could be people who are running polling places. They could be individuals who are um, uh, uh, doing events in schools and talking with parents and trying to speak with businesses to make that happen. The actors run the organization, the business, whatever. Um, so map them out and you need to know who those actors are. Then B and V. Now B and V are the flip sides of two different uh, of the coin. So if we used the cat woe uh, model, this, we would use C, which is customers. But I like the B and V better, and this is what they stand for. The B stands for beneficiaries, and the V stands for victims. Here's how this works. So if we're doing our uh, school levy example, if we're raising money for schools, for, um, for arts education, then um, our beneficiaries are children. Anyone who would participate in that arts experience and that training would benefit. I imagine their parents would benefit too. Probably the community benefits. There are many uh, um, radiating circles of benefits in this model in a very systems approach, but the, the pinpoint day in day out benefit beneficiaries are the children. So define who benefits from your transformation. If we create this thing, these are the people, this is the environment. These are the animals that will benefit. Remember a beneficiary doesn't have to be a person. Sometimes it can be an environment. It can be animals. It could be something else. Then the V is the flip side. We're the victims. I like how this model highlights that whenever we implement some kind of system, whenever we implement a transformation like raising funds uh, or raising taxes to fuel the arts, there are victims. There are those that this may adversely impact. So consider who the victims are. And remember, the victim also could be the environment. If we are... Um, building a new factory location to manufacture um, bicycles. So, right. So let's say we have a, we have a, a, a organization that comes in. Uh, the owners say we want to build a factory and we want to build bicycles. It's great, right? We're reducing motor vehicles and we're improving how many people will be riding bicycles. Now, who are the victims? Well, if we build a factory, we build a place somewhere in an undeveloped forest, then the victim could be the environment. We have to cut down trees. Um, it may create uh, more traffic in and out of an area that usually has been pretty quiet. Victim could be those living near the factory because there's lots more cars going by, hopefully bicycles of people who are going in and going out. Certainly any kind of trucking is involved to take those bikes out of that facility. So a victim, can be an environment, it could be a person, but it is part of the system. So that's a quick look at soft systems methodology. Here's why it's, I think, so impactful. Each of these letters challenges planners and designers to consider things that we might not when we're designing. It forces you first to do the transformation, to say, this is what we're trying to do. If you can't say it, then you have a real problem. You need a clear transformation. Next, it accounts for the environment, the E, environmental concerns and factors that are outside of our control. They do impact the experience. They do impact the design. If we don't account for them, it creates real problems. Then we move on to the worldview, the ideology, the overall attitude and feeling and, and view of something at the time. Worldview can so easily be passed up because we as designers can say, oh yeah, everybody knows the arts are, are supported. Everybody agrees that the arts are great. When you use this model, it challenges you. Really, what's the worldview? Really consider what is the overall feeling about this issue or matter or initiative at this time? Um, by doing so, it I think helps planners and designers to consider things that they might otherwise miss that really could make a mess for the future if we ignore.
In other words, if we get all the way to the end of a process and we implement a factory and then realize it's inconsistent with the worldview, that factory will probably not be sustainable and real problems will happen and a lot of money and time will have been wasted. Next, it identifies owners. There are individuals in any design that want to make it go. They are the initiators, the owners who are the decision makers. It makes those individuals and organizations very real. Then it also highlights beneficiaries and victims. When we're designing, we must consider who's going to benefit from this and who's not. By doing so, we might better weigh, okay, there's a whole lot of beneficiaries and there are very few victims here. It seems as if this design initiative could be really promising. On the flip side, we might take an existing design and look at it and see, there's a ton of victims right now and very few beneficiaries. We've got to improve this. Our real problem is we're creating serious harm or our business is not succeeding because there are too many victims. So soft systems methodology visualizes what is called a rich picture. By doing this, we can see all the parts outlined. And this is my very rough kind of way of whiteboarding in front of you on my iPad right here. But the core of Saw Systems methodology is draw the pictures, draw it out and make it real, whether it's on post-it notes, it's on a whiteboard or whatever, visualize the rich picture, see all the parts because in our minds or on spreadsheets, it's so easy to miss all these parts. If you follow Batwove and implement this method by putting all those parts out there, a lot of times you can find this is the real issue. This is the problem that's keeping us from being sustainable. Let's do something about it. All right. Thanks for listening to me. Soft Systems Methodology. We'll see you out there.